Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I as a human being, I can't do that. I, I can't. I can't allow. No, no matter. Like even if it's a student who, you know, I, I didn't like or you know whatever. Like you know, I, I couldn't allow that person to get pummeled. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, yeah. I just. Whatever the rules are, I don't care. And you know what? If you want to throw me out of school, I'm going to let all these parents know that you threw me out of the school because I defended a child from physical harm. Yeah. And I want you, administrators, I'm just thinking, like, if that would have happened, mm-hmm. that's what I would have done. Yeah. Um, and, and I just can't believe that that is the rule. Mm-hmm. And, and it shouldn't be the rule. And, and we could easily change it so that it's no, you know, that I'm not going to say it should be compulsory uh, physical intervention, but it could be a choice. You know, if you want to intervene, if you feel like you can, you know, because some students are very strong. Right. Um, but my, my, I feel like I want to get to the deeper root issues. Like, how can we get to the point where violence in school, like students have other tools that they can use to deal with their problems rather than beating the tar out of out of a girl. I had a I had a fight break out of my classroom and a girl just stood up while I was teaching, just stood up, walked to the other side of the classroom, pulled this, ripped this girl's braids out of her head and started whipping her with her own bloody braids in, in the middle of my class. And after where I mean I called security and they came and got them. And and I was shocked. I'm like, what? the heck ha- like what happened i mean i i'm just i'm up there teaching and they, she just goes over there and starts whipping her to death with her own braids and when i asked her what happened she looked at me and she said she looked at me wrong that that was her response i'm like why did you beat her up she looked at me wrong and like we need to deal with those things like we can right. who, who cares about again graphing the inverse of a function if you see someone looking at you weird and you think that your solution to that is to go walk over to her, rip her braids out of her head and whip her to death with them. Like who can, who cares about the quadratic function, right? right? Like there, there are so much bigger issues that are going on right now that honestly, like the, the content is secondary. The, the content is secondary. If you can't learn how to communicate, how to disagree respectfully, if you can't learn how to problem solve, how to think critically, how to collaborate with people that are different than you, like all of these skills that I think adults could learn a lot from figuring out how to do those things too. But we have to start giving our children the opportunity to do that. And and they will never learn that if they're experiencing violence at home and then continuing to experience violence in school from their teachers, from their peers, from administrators all day, every day for 13 years of their life. It just, we can't. And then think what kind of a society we're going to have when, when they get out, right? When they're adults. It I, just. I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, I think that, you know, us two, I'll just say reasonable people, log- <laughs> logical people who, you know, see this, you know, and I'm, I'm going to say you, you have two children. I do. Yeah. Okay. More than likely your two children will, will grow up perfectly fine, you know, cause they're in a great environment and, you know, they have a, they have a smart mother and, you know, like that gives a shit about them. Mm-hmm. But it, it's unfortunately that, you know, these kids, like you said, in the be- I think it was the beginning of your book, you, you know, these kids from broken homes, whether it's, um, you know, the parents dead, the, the you know, the mother never um, was married. So the father just dipped and ran. Mm-hmm. Um, father was deported. Um, grandparents are raising the child. You know, all these different um, scenarios, you know, these, these different fa- familial um, setups. Well, I'll just say, I don't know what the proper word is. I'm sorry. But, um, cause I'm not a social worker. I'm, I, I deal with, I always say I deal in photography and video <laughs> and audio and, and, you know, hearing this stuff just makes me sad to be honest with you. It, it makes me sad that I, and I don't, I don't want to say the word is privilege, but I was, I'm, I'm happy that I grew up in a loving environment. I wish every kid out there could, could have that. Me too. Um, and you're right. That needs to be solved. I don't know how we solve it, 
Mm-hmm. I maybe your book later on talks about it. Um, um the the home piece. Well, I think I think the home piece is more of what my first book was about: gospel based parenting in in learning how to treat children with kindness and respect and, and, and who, patience. Who, it, who huh? is that book geared towards? Um, so that book I actually publish as as a Christian. So my audience for that book is Christian parents, but it's I think it's applicable to any parent, but in particular with Christian parents, um, because I was researching about how to answer the question, how can I spank my child the way the Bible says? That was mm-hmm. my question. Interesting. That I, I started researching. <laughs> how can I spank my child the way the Bible says? Because I really wanted to do what the Bible, I really wanted to obey God's word on that topic. And I wanted to make sure that I was doing it right. I was raised being spanked. Um, and so I've of course, I anticipated that I would do the same with my child. And the more that I started researching and learning about what the Bible actually teaches on that subject, I found that the Bible actually doesn't say. Um, and a lot of people take scripture out of context to say that, you know, I'm sure you've heard spare the rod and spoil the child before. That was a, are you familiar with that phrase? Yes, I will. Yes, very much yeah. so. A lot, of, a lot of people said that to me growing up. Um, do you know where that actually comes from? Um. Dr. Dr. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be shocked. Um, so that phrase, spare the rod and spoil the child, actually comes from a 16th century erotic poem. What? Yeah, it's about sadomasochism, not about children and parenting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so when I found that like Christians are actually quoting this erotic poem about a sadomasochist who wants her lover to whip her um, and spank her, it kind, of, it kind of puts things in a different perspective, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, that is not what the Bible teaches about this at all. Um, and so, yeah, as I started researching about that, I just started learning that that's really not what the Bible teaches. And and um, and then I started answering. And once I realized, okay, there is no biblical basis for me to hit my child as a form of discipline, then I started asking the question, okay, well, what what does the Bible teach or how should I be interacting with my child? And then, of course, that goes to how do I, how should I be interacting with other human beings? And, and again, coming back to that foundation of I should interact with people through respect, through patience, through love, through kindness, through gentleness, um, through, you know, all these different aspects that, you know, in the Bible, they refer to them as the fruits of the spirit. Um, I know other faiths have different ways that they talk about that you should treat people, treat others as you want to be treated, you know, all those kinds of ideas and concepts that are kind of universal, I think. And, and when we really start looking at that of like, this is how we should treat and interact with other human beings. I can't expect my child to be kind and gentle to someone else if the way that I interact with them is through yelling at them or through threatening to take away their toys or through hitting them if they spill their food or, you know, all of these other ways that I see so many parents interacting with their children. And, and as a teacher, I mean, there were times that like I would have a parent teacher conference and I would have parents tell me, I'm going to whip your ass when I get you home. And I'm like, whoa, like, cause they got a C on something, you know, like, and I just, it just, it breaks my heart. And I'm like, why, why are we interacting with human beings in this way? You know? And it's just those, the, again, those cycles of abuse that just continue from generation to generation to generation. And, and it, I think it's time for us to really stop and reflect and say, why are we treating people this way? And, and to look for new ways to interact with one another, whether that be Republicans and Democrats, teachers and students, parents and children, whatever that dynamic is between other human beings. I think that if we can commit to treat people with gentleness, kindness, respect, love, you know, patience, forgiveness, all these kinds of things, I think it would make a huge difference in our world. If only things were perfect like that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and it doesn't have, you know, of course it's not perfect, right? Like I'm, I'm human too. Like there are times that I want to scream at my kids, but again, the, the difference is that I have, I have a, I have like a foundational commitment, like that I'm going to treat my child with the same love and gentleness and kindness and respect that I expect from her, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, I think that that's where the difference is. I don't think that and I have a right to tell you what to do or force you to do things or try to humiliate you or threaten you. Like, I, I'm not going to interact with you in that way. Right. And I, I think people need to understand that all these issues you're talking about, are so very important in early childhood. Yeah. Especially. Yes. 
But what I'll also say, and this is, and I, and I think it's just, I think it just naturally happens that a child, you know, gets to the point, of, I'll just say like puberty, you know, ages 11 through 14. Yeah. And, and the, the, the parents kind of just, you know, they stop going, they stop going to, you know, the different um, school band performances or choir or, um, yeah. you know, whatever else, whatever the, the school activities are, they stop coming to the parent teacher, you know, back to school nights um, that they yeah. had the ice cream socials, you know, <laughs> the, these, these, I, I went to an elementary school and, you know, the auditorium is packed. Yep. And then I go, and I know this is going to sound weird, but I'm like, okay, you put a sign out in front of the school. I figure this is open to the public. So I went and checked out my local school's um, spring concert. Hmm. There's barely anybody there. Yeah. And I thought that was so sad because these students worked their butts off to like learn these different songs. And they're like better performers. I mean, you know, they're not like little squeaky trumpet and, and they're not squeaking the violin. They're not, you know, uh, they're not hitting the wrong notes on the drums. Like they're actually like, you know, getting their, their chops. With their, that, that's what they, we say in the musical community. Yeah. Um, they got chops. Mm-hmm. But their parents aren't there or, or their guardians aren't there to like come and watch. And it's so sad. And... You know, and, and, and I think we're, we're missing that with the older students. And that is, I mean, I think everything is important. Every single grade level is, is important in some way um, for this kid, for them to be good adults. Right. But again, I, I think it's, again, not so much about the grade level, you know, and you talked about the importance of, of, acting this way and and really focusing on the way that we're treating young children in particular, because it really does form, you know, their, their brains and the way that they think and process and, and abuse at a young age is extremely traumatic and children Absol- carry absolutely. that with them for the rest of their lives. And it impacts who they are as teenagers and as adults. Um, but you're right. Like the, the teenagers are still really missing that, that too. And I think that's one of the reasons why I have been such a strong advocate for, for homeschooling because the time that we have with our children is so short. And when we really look at how much time we make our kids do these ridiculous, and I will say meaningless, useless things that we make them do in school, like think about how many hours and days and months and years that our children are learning useless things in school that they will never use once they leave again. Yeah. And that's time that they're spending away from their parents, time they're spending out like away from the community where they could be getting mentorships and internships and 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 building their own community, building relationships with people, having time with their mom or their dad or you know siblings, whatever that might look like for them. Like they're really missing out on such valuable time that they will never have back. And and instead we're trapping them in these buildings, making them do ridiculous things that have no value for them that they don't care about. And then expecting them to just behave all day, like no yeah, one would do that. I would, I would definitely agree with that. Especially, you know, I, I, I was thinking about the the kid that called you, you know, an F and B. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I he felt like he probably felt like Spanish class was a waste of his time. It, it was, and they and I they told me that. I had a student that tell me that told me that once, and he said, "You think I'm going to give a fuck about Spanish class?" He said, "I'll be lucky if I make it to be 18 years old." He told me every single man. This broke my heart. He said, "Every single man in my life has either been dead or in prison before they turned 18." Why do you think I get? Why would you think I would ever give a fuck about your stupid Spanish homework? I'm yes. like, he said that to me, and it. I was like, wow, that is a perspective that I have not encountered before in my life, and he's right. If you anticipate that you're either going to be dead or in prison by the time you turn 18, why would you do Spanish homework? Like, really, why, why would you? There's yeah. no point. Like, that's that's what he expected for his life. And and I asked them, my students the next day, I, I asked them, I said, no, can you guys just close your eyes, raise your hand if you know someone who has been shot, murdered, like something like that. Every single hand in my classroom went up. Every single hand. And that was in PG County. Mm. And it just, they are experiencing a world that I had no insight into. Like their world was so foreign to the way that I was raised and and the things that I was able to experience growing up. And it just, 
we, we can't expect students to care about Spanish homework when all they're worried about is surviving and making it to the next day and getting money to eat and, and having to deal drugs in order to do that. Like it just, it, it's not realistic. And there, and there are so many aspects of, of life, I think that, that needs to change, but you know, a lot of it is above my pay grade too, you know, is just me. I, I know that I can't do all of that by myself. Right. But I think that the more that we can have these conversations and and start, you know, communicating at the very beginning with with parents at home, the way that you treat your child matters, the environment that you have your child in, it matters. And, and that's why I think that the best place for a child to be is very far from a public school classroom. Most of the public school classrooms are extremely, extremely toxic, abusive environments. And kids deserve better. We, we we shouldn't be wasting people's time. That's I absolutely that that, that foundational thing that, that that you know your your statement on that is so true. And um, now later in the book, do you get to you know some of your ideas on how that can be solved? And I'm not asking you to say I'm on here because I want people to buy your book. <laughs> I want people to buy your book because I know how long it takes to to write one of these things. Yes. <laughs> and and the amount of thought that goes into it and um, you know, so I want people to, to, to buy it. Can you get it on Kindle as well as physical? Or yes, that- yep, you can get it on Kindle. It's also available in paperback. And I'm hoping by the end of the summer, it will also be available in audiobook for those of you that like to listen. Awesome. Uh, but I, I do, I know that the picture that I, I paint sounds very bleak. Um, and, and it is important that we can see it for what it really is. Um, What's well, the first step in the 12 step process? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have to be able to really look honestly at at the situation in order to to do something different, but if I could pick one thing, um I would completely I would take away like all aspects of force and coercion from the classroom. Um I think teachers are incredible and they have so much to offer students. But you can't teach someone that doesn't want to learn and that doesn't care about what you're trying to force them to learn. And so I think that if we can give children educational freedom, um, where they're able to choose what and when and how and from I'm stealing who that phrase. they're learning. Yes. <laughs> Which fr- educational freedom? Educational freedom. I'm stealing it. Do I'm it. trademarking it. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> Don't just kidding. trademark it. That I'm just great. kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that if I could advocate for one thing, it would be that. I think kids deserve to have educational freedom. It will make happier children, happier teachers. Oh, I'm smiling just thinking about it. it. It's it's incredible. And, and actually, that's what I do with my own children. It kind of started as a little experiment for me when I first started learning about self-directed learning and child-led education. I I was very hesitant. I was like, there's no way. How can kids just right. learn? Right. Right. Learn? It's, so, it's so foreign to us. Right. And, and I, I was shocked. I, I was like, there's no way that, you know, my, at the time my daughter was four. Um, and actually I pulled her out of, she went to public school for a couple hours cause I was a single mom and I had to work and she went to a public pre-K and one day she came home with marks on her wrist cause her teacher dragged her to timeout. Oh my goodness. And after that I said no more. Um, and so she never went back after that day. And at the time I was reading and learning about, you know, self-directed learning and, and, um, and child led it, you know, learning. And I just, I was shocked. I was like, there's no way. So I figured I'd give myself one year to really experiment with that idea. But is it possible for a child to learn without someone forcing them to learn? And I was terrified. You know, I was like, I'm going to be the only reading teacher with a child that doesn't know how to read, you know? Right. Um, but my daughter is eight years old now and she reads well above her normal grade level. Nice. Um, and she actually published two books. I have never taught that child to read. Never. Like, never she taught herself how to read all by herself um she taught herself to write she loves to write she's teaching herself math like and it just it blows my mind to see the things that children learn when they have an intrinsic desire to learn and I think that's one of the biggest things that schools do is we really when you add force to the mix it it completely destroys intrinsic motivation, right? Yes, if the only absolutely. reason for, to learn something is because you're going to get a gold sticker or you're going to get an A or you're going to get whatever other reward or bribe we want to, you know, try to incentivize kids with, or we threaten them, right? That's the opposite. Pizza Hut paying pizza. 
yep, <laughs> Pizza Hut, book it, whatever, you know, all these things. Like we try to bribe kids to learn different things and it takes the joy out of learning just for the sake of learning what it, whatever that thing is. Right. Um, right. And we, we can't create lifelong learners if we keep trying to bribe them and coerce them to learning, like learning for itself isn't enjoyable in and of itself, you know? Um, so, yeah, and I, I love seeing, you know, children that, that are experiencing educational freedom and the things that they create. And I've met other children that have been raised with that kind of idea. And it's, it's remarkable. It is remarkable. The things that they do. Awesome. Well, I, I think it's worth trying. I, I don't know if it, it <laughs> I hope people can be convinced to at least try it. Like you said, it, it, let's try a different social experiment. Because that's yeah. what that's how you put what our current education system is. It really is a yeah. social experiment. Yep. Remove all the curriculum. Use the schools. The buildings are incredible. There are so many resources in the buildings. And and let children choose. Let them choose what and when and where and how and from whom they're going to learn. And see what they create. I guarantee it will be much better than them trying to Google the answers to a multiple choice test five minutes before it happens. Like they will be so much more fulfilled and and they will be able to really learn skills that are valuable in this day and age. I mean, it's they deserve that. They deserve to have the time to figure out who they are, what they love, and what they want to contribute to the world. I, let's just try it. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> let's go back to the old system, you know? It, it doesn't, it it doesn't hurt to try. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to try. Yeah, no, it doesn't hurt to try. I mean, if, if we, hey, we, we lost an entire year and a half of school. You know, and and these kids are, you know, behind so much. So, you know, what's another heck? Just give it six months. Don't not, we don't even need to try it for a year. If it's chaos, revert, <laughs> revert back to the old ways. Um, but no, somebody asked me, like, Adam, how do you have all these words in your head? I'm like, I honestly don't know. But no, I, I've been a lifelong reader. Um, I, I, I watch people who are smarter than me. Hmm. And I, I, I hum, I'm humble enough to know that there's people who are smarter than me in different aspects of things, whether yeah. that's, I mean, I always say, um, this, this woman I know, she, I believe has a photographic memory, if not close to it, it's, it's, it's as photographic as you can imagine. And it's, it's bad because anything I say to her, she remembers. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be very careful about what I say. <laughs> Because it gets used against me. Oh gosh! Um, but um, <laughs> that's a pretty th- impressive the, skill, though. Yeah, but the thing is, this this same woman, for some reason, just can't get technology. Hmm. So she's great at memorizing words, memorizing faces, memorizing names. Hmm. But when it comes to operating her iPhone, <laughs> <laughs> um, she just can't get it. And like, to me, I just dive into that stuff. So, you know, it's that thing it's, and and I'm trying to like relate this to what you were saying. Um, you know, maybe somebody likes building things. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody likes doing, um, now this is, this is where we kind of, this is like an older, older, you know, let's say 14 and older, um, student, but you know, where we can start teaching them how to, if they want to be an electrician, you know, mm-hmm. we would have that. We, you know, if they want to learn how to um, uh, be a beautician, I'll just say, you know, so what, yeah. what, you know, a salon, hair salon or nail salon, whatever, you mm-hmm. know, those skills, because those are, those are skills that are in demand, you know, especially yeah. any of those STEM, as they say, um, or really, really where they're losing, they always say, you know, electrical work, plumbers, mm-hmm. whatever. They always say there is a demand, but then when I look at it, I'm like, wait a minute. So your company wants workers, but you're not willing to pay for their training? <laughs> Here's my problem with that. I go to McDonald's, and I've, I've asked them this at the drive-thru. I actually made a funny video. I'll send it to you. Okay. I go to the drive-thru, and I say, I, I went to like Wendy's and McDonald's and Burger King. Uh, do you have an internship program that I can be a part of? And, and, and they're like, what? I'm like, an internship. They're like, what's that? I'm like, well, basically, I work for free. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. You, we, we train you. I'm like, do I get paid when I'm getting trained? Yeah. I'm like, holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> you know, I, and it's a joke, but I'm like, wait a minute. How come these fast food restaurants are paying for mm. training, 
But I went to college and my, I'm not going to say me, my parents spent 40, I went to, you know, I went to college back in 2002 to 2006, mm-hmm. uh, $14,000 a year. And then I go and look for a job at these different video production companies and there's none available and they all want me to work for free and not pay me. And I'm like, wow, this is quite something, you know, like I, I may as well have worked, worked, at, worked at McDonald's for four years. I would have been ahead of the uh, curve. Um, <laughs> it's funny what you're saying about videos. I have to tell you a story about a student of mine. He he was in my algebra two class and he was failing algebra two, like desperately failing algebra two. I think he had like a six percent. I mean, something really awful. Um, and I had to do an interview with him for, um, for special education and talk with him about his goals and his dreams and things like that. And I asked him if he'd ever had a job before. And he told me that he makes videos. Um, and I was like, Oh, that's cool. He said he makes YouTube videos. And I was like, just out of curiosity, like how much do you make for your YouTube videos? And he was like, Oh, I made like, like two to three, something like that. And, um, and I was like, oh, you made like two to three hundred dollars. Like, that's pretty cool. You know? And he was like, no, like two to three thousand and <laughs> per month. And well, and I was like, oh, you made three, you know, three thousand dollars last year. And he was like, no, last month. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, I was like, what videos, are, what kind of videos are you making? And he was like, I play video games and I record myself playing video games and people watch them. And like, he's making thousands of dollars in his spare time outside of school, mind you, like he's spending right. the majority of his day in school, um, feeling like a complete failure because he's, he failed algebra two. And I'm like, you failed algebra two, but you're making more money than most people. And you're like 15 years old. Like, right. And imagine if he had all day long to be able to invest in that skill that he's passionate about, that he loves in making videos and playing video games. I mean, how bizarre. Like, there's so many ways for people to be successful. The the internet has changed so much with our economy, for better and for worse. I always said, um, one of the things I, I was saying to the governor in one of my YouTube videos was, you do realize that this is gonna, like, point out to companies like you know if you're going to force people to work remotely they're going to say wait a minute why can't i hire somebody that lives in india or whatever whatever country and i'll be able to do that pay them one third of what i'm paying an american worker and -hmm. then we just lost an american job thanks a lot larry hogan i'm I'm giving a thumbs up you can't (laughs) see it right now and 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 he didn't all these politicians were so selfish with what they did to people's incomes Mm-hmm. You know, and I was especially hit because uh, I one of my one of my video production mainstays is event work. So whether that's uh, weddings, wow. corporate corporate, oh, non- nonprofits, um, pol- political. So when you know I go around and I don't care what party you're at. And, and by the way, I am one one of the one of the politicians campaign form. Uh, even though I'm you know a Democrat running for county executive, yes. I went to a Republicans event. I recorded a video at their event. You want to know why? Because I have bills. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if you're a libertarian. I don't care if you're a Green Party member. I don't care if you're a member of the Socialist Party. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care if you're independent. Um, work is work. You mm-hmm. know, so anyway, I kind of got off track there. But my, my point with it was... Um, I had to do what I, what I could. And I was literally like, I felt like I was a running a speakeasy at one point. Um, just like a lot of like people that cut hair and, uh, do dog grooming and do nails. I don't know if you've realized this, but, um, they were kind of like, like basically if you were to call up one of these nail salons, um, and I, I know this cause my, um, one of my female friends will say, um, uh, tried this. People were leaving messages on the answering machines. Mm hmm. And getting appointments, and they would, but they would have to go at like night, and mm. like the, the the basically the 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 salons were like their lights were off, but that what they would do is they would like have like um, I want to call it like a like a sunlight, like one of those lights that are like like the beams are controllable. Yeah, I can't let the government see you getting your nails done. <laughs> yeah, well, that's and 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 people, I'm telling you, people are gonna look back at this ten years from now and be like, Adam, you were right. 
<laughs> all the people that were saying the same things as you were right. Because what I what I did is I made a compilation of like all these people leaving comments on Governor Hogan and some other politicians' pages. You know, saying what are you doing? You're like destroying our way of life, and you you don't you know. And, and it wasn't just me, but I'm like I'm like every day I was making a video like calling this stuff out, and it's just unbelievable. Like you said, the, the silent game. Yep. Um, and all the people that were able to. Re- to work remotely we're, we're perfectly fine mm-hmm. um well i, I don't want to say perfectly fine they did it <laughs> as best they could and, and i i actually um i think i had said one of my relatives is a teacher and i got to see how she um because i was curious i'm like i want to see you know because i'm because i'm a video person i'm like let me see how you know and i want to see how you do things and oh my goodness it was chaos it was <laughs> Um, hey, turn your camera on. Hey, I can't see you. You walked away from your, from your table. Um, yeah. See, it, things like that. I'm like, who who cares? Who cares if they have if, if they have their camera on or not? If I don't have my camera on right now. Or, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. It just, why do we have to like nitpick kids about these things? And again, it's just that, that power and control trip, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, but... I'm sorry, I interrupted you. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no problem. Remote learning for for classrooms that are, you know, 25 plus, or I would even say 15 plus kids, because I don't know if you've ever been on a Zoom call with more than 10 people. Oh, yeah, I I taught during COVID. I taught remotely during COVID. It's chaos. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know how, I mean, we're talking, I'm saying adults. Adults forgetting to to mute their microphone. (laughs) You know, adults, I hate to say it, picking their nose on camera and you're like, you know, you're like, you send them like a private chat message. You know, we can see you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, so it's like, um, my goodness, like when I I, I don't know how my uh, relative, I almost almost slipped up and said it. We're not live, but (laughs) um, I don't know how my relative did it. I, 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 my, my hat is off to her and. And, you know, when I made my comments on Monday during the debate, I, I didn't mean to, like, disparage teachers, not at all. I, I thought that the politicians threw them and, the, and the, the Maryland school board threw them into a, can I just say, it, shitty situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't even give them the choice. Like, they should have put it to the teachers' vote. Not don't, don't assume that the teachers' union is telling the truth. They mm-hmm. have the ability to, to have a vote. You know, like they, they know they, they, you know, they were there. Could, they could have figured out a way where they could have said, OK, teachers, do you want to keep teaching remotely or do you want to, you know, because now that we've realized that this virus isn't as deadly as we once thought it was, are you comfortable coming in and teaching? And, mm-hmm. and it should have been hybrid. I'm going to say as soon as like. So I don't know if too at least the fall of 2020, at least the fall of 2020.